Uh, um, I have no idea. Why did Jesus die? Je di Jesus, I should really know this. Big question for early in the morning, isn't it? Jesus died for people, other people. He's saving us. Was it Pontius Pilate probably got a bit jealous of Jesus getting all the birds, so... We all die. People die for different reasons. Uh, to, well, it, I think it was supposed to be like for our sins, wasn't it? Jesus died because people didn't agree with him. Well, probably fear is why he died more than anything else. Didn't he, like, sacrifice himself on the cross? So, it was his choice. Jesus died because of people's beliefs. That's up for discussion. Everybody dies. No one lives forever. Well, I've got a question for you tonight. What do Katy Perry, David Beckham, Jay-Z and the Pope have in common? It's a good one. Well, they all wear a cross. And I suppose that isn't so surprising because uh, many of us do, don't we? People get cross tattoos, you wear them on T-shirts, uh, on jewellery, you have cross earrings. But has it ever struck you as slightly odd because the cross was actually a form of execution for, for criminals. So I just thought, what would you think tonight? I had a little set of gallows here. If I uh, wore these and I just was wandering around, met you, lovely to meet you. It's a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, it's just a bit morbid. So why? Why do they wear the cross? What is the cross? Well, the cross in a way is like the Christian logo. It sort of represents everything that uh, Christianity stands for. And it's a big question, the cross. And the front of Time magazine asked the same question, and some of you tonight might be asking this question. Why did Jesus have to die? What is it about? And like some of you possibly, I didn't grow up a Christian. I didn't come from a Christian family. We went to the kind of obligatory Christmas and possibly Easter, but Quite frankly, I didn't see how Christianity had any possible relevance to my life, to my life choices. And I was from a really great family. I'm one of four sisters and uh, great parents. And it wasn't until quite early on that we hit a bit of a crossroads in our life and I started to rethink. My dad, who I absolutely loved, um, one day came home and disclosed uh, a completely secret life that none of us had known about. And it involved deception and multiple affairs. And for me, suddenly everything that I thought was true, everything I'd sort of, was my compass, had smashed. And uh, we went through a pretty volatile couple of years in our family. And uh, I suppose for me, one of the, the lowest points was when I tried to find, when I found my father trying to commit suicide. And I remember that night so well, because I remember thinking, there has got to be more than this. What is it all about? And I remember thinking, you know, life is so short. It brought the shortness of life very close to me. And I, I started, I suppose, my own little search. And I remember reading the Quran and getting involved in what was then the New Age movement. And, um, I thought that my past life had been really bad, so I was being punished in this life. And my two sisters who were running the Mystic Society at Cambridge University told me that was the case. But the reason to keep going was that my next one would be better. But if I'm really honest, in those moments when I was just by myself, I felt really empty. And I felt really, really desperate. And uh, my mother got quite ill during this time and she ended up in hospital and I used to go and do my homework in hospital and uh, it was kind of that time I went to a Church of England school where they said you know would you like to get confirmed which is like a public declaration of your faith and I remember going to the hospital that afternoon and saying to my mum mum I'm really sorry I know I'd get brilliant presents from my godparents but I can't do it because you know they're such hypocrites you know that Christians are so flaky and we're really strong women and um, my mum wasn't a Christian, but she just said, darling, won't you do it for me? Won't you find somewhere else and, and, and won't you do it for me? And quite frankly, I would have done almost anything for her. So 
uh, through, through a series of, of conversations, one of her great friends that she played bridge with said, oh, I've got the perfect society church in Knightsbridge for Sarah to go to, HTV. And I remember pitching up the first night. I remember coming in here and I was terrified. I don't know if any of you were the first night of Alpha. I thought, what am I going to? And, um, but all I can say is, as I sat and I started to listen to these talks, Week after week, I suddenly thought, there is something in this. There is something that these people have. And they just were, there was always like a twinkliness in their eye. They were so smiling, sometimes a little like, a bit suspicious about that. But there was something I saw in them. And I knew that I had to make a decision. And so I became a Christian. And what I hadn't anticipated when I made that decision was the extraordinary love that I was going to experience, the extraordinary, limitless love of God. And St. John's Gospel puts it like this, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not die but have everlasting life. The New Testament is all about God's love. So what's the problem, you might ask? You know, I, uh, I can't really see a problem. I lead a good life. I'm quite happy with myself. And of course, that might be true. But every human being is made in the image of God. Every one of you is a masterpiece of God. And therefore, of course, human beings do amazing things. They have amazing capacity because they're made in God's image. And you know, Christians they're not saying that they're any better than anybody else. But maybe they're hopefully saying they're becoming better people than they were. So there's something very good, isn't there? There's something very noble about humankind. But I know there's another side of the coin. You know, I know I do stuff that hurts people. I mess up. And they are things I'm not proud of. And the New Testament puts it like this. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you know, this is hard to admit, isn't it? It's hard to admit in a, in a big group. It's hard to admit with people that know us. And it's also sometimes hard to admit to ourselves. I often find it hard to say I'm wrong. You know, that kind of word, sorry, sticks in your throat. And have you noticed when two cars collide or bicycles collide, it's very rare that someone says, oh, I'm so sorry, that was entirely my fault. <laughs> I, um, I came across some of the things that people say uh, to their insurance companies when they are putting in their accident claim forms. These are some of the excuses. First one, one man wrote this, going home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that wasn't there. <laughs> Another person wrote this, the guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> and then this one. I've been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. <laughs> or this one. The pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. <laughs> and finally, I love this is my favorite. This is a good one. Um, I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. <laughs> <laughs> If we're honest, we've all messed up. We've all sinned. And you know, sometimes people say, well, yeah, I'm not perfect. I don't lead a perfect life. But compared to others, uh, you know, I'm fine. And I want to ask, whose standard are we measuring? Compared to who are we doing OK? So we're going to have a little group activity. I want you to imagine that this lectern here is uh, the moral scale of goodness, OK? And it represents everyone that's ever lived, OK? Ever, ever lived, OK? So up here is those who've been really, really good, really good people. Down here, really evil, OK? Very simple. I'm going to read out names, and you're going to tell me where to put them. So let's start. Mother Teresa, where do, where do you think she goes? Up top. Should we, should we put her, what, here? She's pretty high, isn't she? Yeah, yeah? OK, good. Hitler. Where's Hitler going? Floor. Oh, he's going on the floor. That's a new one. He's going on the floor down here. OK. Uh, Simon Cowell. Where's Simon Cowell going? Anyone? Down? 
further up. We're, we're not sure about this, are we? Shall we, shall we sort of, oh my goodness, Mother Trees has fallen. Um, let's put her, there she is. Okay, uh, Donald Trump. Oh no, no, maybe, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Bit controversial for tonight. You, where would you put you in this scale? <laughs> The New Testament says, all of us, each one of us, has fallen short of this scale because none of us match up to Jesus. And the scale is not the top of this lectern, it's not the ceiling, it's the sky. We can never reach up to that. And you might say, well, what's the point? We may as well all go home. We've blown it. But it matters. And it matters because they're consequences. And we're going to look really quickly at four of the consequences. consequences. And I made it easy, it all begin with P. The first consequence is the pollution of sin. Pollution in our environment is a massive issue. But Jesus says we're able to pollute our soul. He says that it's what comes out of here. It's our thoughts, it's our words. We're able to hurt people, to damage people. We, we mess up relationships. But we don't only mess up our relationships with one another. We break our relationship with God. The pollution of sin. Then there's the power of sin. The bad stuff we do is actually addictive. And I don't know about you, but I've seen this. You know, you just get, it's harder to break the cycle that takes you down and down. And I remember um, a while ago, we had a great girlfriend of ours staying with us at home, and um, my husband and I were just watching her because she was working flat out all day, then she was doing evening shifts, she was working at weekends, and eventually, after a couple of days, we just said to her, you know, you can't sustain this, you're going to burn out, what, 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 what's this all about? And she didn't tell us immediately, but eventually she said, you know, I'm so embarrassed, she said, but I'm addicted to shopping. She said, I, 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 I feel bad and I go out and I shop and then I feel better and I spend money I don't have and then I feel so bad for spending that money that the only way that I can feel good again is by going shopping. And she got herself into tens of thousands of pounds of debt over clothes and shoes. She couldn't break the cycle. Now, it, it might be a bit of an extreme example, but that's how addiction works, isn't it? The only way we feel better is by trying to do it again, and it never satisfies. Thirdly, there is a penalty to sin. Love and justice are not opposed. And I believe it's within our nature, isn't it, to seek for justice. You know, when you see some of the atrocities in, in our world, when you see Babies abused, old people beaten up in their own homes, or you see the Vegas shooting. There's something in us that rises up to say, this is not right. Someone needs to pay for this. There's a sense of injustice. There should be a penalty. Someone needs to pay. And I've found it's really easy to say that about other people, but it's far harder to say it about myself. And it's a, it's a silly example, but... Um, Bear with me. Where we live, our road is um, it's a little cut-through road. And really, it's where two lanes go down into one. It should be a one-way street, but it's not. And um, when I'm heading to the tube, there's pavement on one side and there isn't on the other. And really, the quickest way is to really walk down the middle of the street to the tube station. And I find when I'm doing that, these cars, particularly the white van drivers, come so fast down this road. And I'm like, can't you see I'm a pedestrian? You know, I get annoyed with these cars. And yet, when I'm in my car in our street, I find myself thinking, can't you see there's a pavement to walk on? What are you doing walking in the middle of the street? I'm a hypocrite. And it's said, isn't it, that when we point the finger, three fingers point back at us. The New Testament puts it like this. You, therefore, have no excuse when you pass judgment on someone else. You, at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you pass judgment, you do the same thing. 
Then there's the partition of sin. Sin separates us. It separates us from one another. You know when you've had an argument with someone or an awkward conversation or you're, you've fallen out with someone, you just don't want to catch their eye. You, know, you don't really want to be in the same room as them. It's awkward. You, something has separated you. And it's, it's the same thing that we are separated, not just between one another, but separated from God. There's a partition. So that's all the bad news. Is there anything good to say about this? Well, there is good news. There is a solution. And the word gospel means good news. That God so loved the world that he actually did something about this. So what did he do? What did God do? Well, the solution is absolutely brilliant. The most brilliant solution. God himself chose to come in human form in Jesus to die for you and for me. Peter puts it like this. Jesus bore our sins in his body. And that's been called the self-substitution of God. But what does that really mean, the self-substitution of God? Well, during the Second World War, on the 31st of July in 1941, a prisoner escaped from Auschwitz. And in reprisal, the Gestapo randomly selected 10 people to be put in a starvation bunker and to die. And as they selected the ninth, it was a man called Francis Gajinichtek. And as he was selected, he cried out and he said, my poor wife, my children, I will never see them again. And at that moment, something remarkable happened. A young, uh, 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 unassuming little Polish man stepped forward, wire-frimmed glasses, and said, I have no family. I am a priest. I would like to die in his place. And this priest was called Maximilian Kolbe. He was only 47 years old. And he went into the bunker with the other nine, and they were heard praying, singing hymns. They, he transformed the atmosphere in this bunker. And apparently he was the last to die. In fact, he had to be given an injection of carbolic acid in the end of August, 1941. 41 years later, October 1982, in Rome, in uh, St. Peter's Square, you can picture it, a massive crowd gathered. There were some 150,000 people, 26 cardinals, bishops, and in the middle of that was Francis Gajinichtek. And the Pope said this. He said, when he spoke about Maximilian Kolbe, who died in, in his place, he said, it was a victory like that one by our Lord Jesus Christ because he died in place of someone else. And in the obituary of Francis Gajanictet, it says that for the next 50 years that he lived, he went round telling everybody about what this man had done for him by taking his place, by being his substitute. And what the New Testament says is even more astonishing than that story. It says that Jesus died for you and for me. Cicero described crucifixion as the most cruel and hideous of tortures. And eventually it was actually banned by the Romans, but it was the height of pain and the depth of shame. But what's so interesting is the New Testament doesn't focus on that physical pain or even the emotional suffering of Jesus on the cross. It focuses on his spiritual suffering. Jesus, on the cross, was bearing my guilt, your guilt, the guilt of the world. And guilt is a horrible emotion. And I really have struggled to understand how that moment of one man on a cross could have any effect to what I'm doing now. And it never really connected until somebody illustrated it like this to me. They took a passage from the Old Testament from Isaiah, which goes like this. It talks about Jesus. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. 
We've turned everyone to our own way, that's us. And the Lord has laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And he said it like this, he said, let's, let's say this hand represents you and me. And let's say that this book represents all the bad stuff, all the rubbish, all the stuff in our life that we don't like. And that stuff is on us, it's, it's preventing us from any relationship with God. And the passage goes like this. All of us have gone astray, each to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the rubbish of us all. And Jesus, at that moment on the cross, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was because he was cut off from the Father, not because of his sin, because he was sinless, not because of what he'd done, but because of what we've done. And they went on to say, do you see where that now leaves us? That leaves us free for a relationship with God. The New Testament talks about the result of the cross of that moment. And it's like a beautiful diamond. And a, a diamond is multifaceted and there's so many angles you can look at and different perspectives. But one that it shows is how much God loves us. Greater love, Jesus said, has no person than this, than they lay down their life for their friend. If you have ever doubted that God loves you, just look to the cross. But even more, the cross tells us about the very nature of God. And all of us have suffering in our lives. Everybody, I don't know anybody who's not struggling with something. And they're big questions, you know, how does God allow suffering? And you know, it's, they're difficult questions to answer. But one thing we know is that God knows what it's like to suffer. He has suffered. He suffered for us, and he now suffers and walks alongside us. And even more from the cross, we know that evil has been defeated. The cross and the res resurrection, and really they are one, the cross and the resurrection. It, the resurrection wasn't a reversal of some defeat on the cross. The resurrection was the manifestation of a victory. So the death and the resurrection tell us that evil has been defeated because Jesus rose from the dead. The cross did what it said it would do. It really worked. And when we look at the four Ps I mentioned earlier, we can see that the cross dealt with every single one of them. So I'm gonna take them quickly in reverse order. Firstly, the partition the separation, it's been destroyed. God is in the business of reconciliation. And the New Testament says to us, God is reconciling in Christ, the, to the world in Christ. That's you and me. He's reconciling us to himself. And you know, some people say, oh, that's so horrid. What kind of God sends like a third party? It's kind of barbaric to suffer on their behalf. No, no, no. God himself suffered for us. He himself took our rubbish so that we can be free. And that is the good news. That's the extraordinary love that he offers us. And reconciliation is really at the heart of the cross. And I love the work of Charlie Mackesy. Um, you might have seen his prodigal son paintings or his sculpture. Maybe as you came down the drive tonight, that sculpture at the end is one of Charlie's. And it is such a picture of reconciliation. You may know that story of the prodigal son. The, the father and the son, they've had a fallout. The son has left home. He's gone off, decided to make his own way. He's totally broken relationship with his father. And after a while, he decides that actually life isn't so great, and he, he decides slightly sheepishly to come back, thinking that he deserves punishment, and he'll just be like the lowest person and, you know, serve and do whatever his father wants. 
And it talks about the father running. It talks about the father seeing his son and his wide arms welcoming him. It talks about him kissing him, embracing him tenderly, welcoming him, unconditional love. And that is God's love. And some of us haven't had fathers like that. You know, when I think of the image of father, human father, I think of volatility, unpredictability, fear. But when I think of the love of our heavenly father, I think of limitless arms, unconditional freedom. God is in the business of restoration and he restores us to one another. I've seen husbands and wives restored. I've seen friends who've fallen out for years, siblings come back together, relationships being restored. Then the penalty has been paid. Marganita Lansky, she was a well-known humanist journalist and she sat on a BBC panel once and there was a Christian on the panel and this is what she said. What I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. And she added rather wistfully, I have no one to forgive me. You know, and I, I struggled with this connection as well. How could an action in a moment in history, someone's life, be paying for what I'm doing now in London in this time? And Someone helpfully explained it to me like this. It's not a true story, but it's a good illustration. They said there were two friends. They were great friends at school, ended up going to university together. And after university, they went their separate ways. One became a lawyer and a judge, and the other became a criminal. One day, the criminal came before their old friend, the judge, in the dock. And they pleaded guilty to the crime they committed. And the judge faced their old friend and faced a dilemma. What, what do they do? They love this person, love their friend. Yet they couldn't just let them off. That wouldn't be justice. And it's the same dilemma God faces with us. And this is what the judge did. He pronounced the sentence, fined him an appropriate sum, let's say 20,000 pounds, and then he took off his wig and his gown and he came round to the dock and stood with his friend and wrote him a check for 20,000 pounds and gave it to him. Justice and love. And that is what God does for us. He pays that penalty. He, he signs that check because he loves us. And thirdly, we're set free from the power of sin. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Those addictions, that cycle that is so difficult to break, are broken on the cross. And you know, I've had the privilege to see people's addictions broken very practically and in a real way. I remember somebody having a, a very severe cocaine addiction having gone to all the, the, the help and counseling and, and external advice they could. And yet, it was when they encountered the cross that that addiction was broken, they just didn't want it anymore. People are set free when they experience the cross. And that brings me to the fourth thing, cleansed from the pollution of sin. We are cleansed. And, you know, I kind of think we need daily cleansing. It's a bit like your daily shower. Um, the New Testament says it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. And that word cleanses is it's a kinetic word. It's a movement word. It's a continual word. It's a bit like windscreen wipers, continually cleansing, cleaning, washing. And it changes your outlook on everything. Knowing that we have been forgiven knowing that we've been cleansed enables us to forgive. It brings extraordinary freedom. And you know, it's so easy to hold grudges. I, I, I found it, you know, when someone's done something to you that you feel is deserving of a grudge, you know, you kind of lock them in your heart in a cage and occasionally take them out and you did this that, and put them back in. 
But actually, we're the only people who are imprisoned. They may have no idea living their lives quite happily without it. Someone once said to me, it's holding a grudge is like allowing somebody to live rent-free in your head. Or it's like giving someone drinking poison and actually thinking somebody else will die. You're poisoning yourself. I think it's true. It's said the first to apologize is the bravest, the first to forgive is the strongest, and the first to forget is the happiest. But the moment you experience God's forgiveness, you realize you want to forgive. And forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling, but it is an option. Corrie ten Boon is one of my heroines. She was an extraordinary Dutch Christian who um, used to hide Jews during the war in their home with her sister and her father. And one day there was a raid and uh, her sister and her were taken and her father to Ravensbrück concentration camp. And sadly, her sister Betsy died in the concentration camp, but Corrie survived. And she used to go around giving talks, talking about God's forgiveness when she came out of Ravensbrück, talking about the power of his forgiveness, the love of God. And one day she was in Munich giving a talk like this. And at the end of her talk, she saw this man come towards her. And as he came towards her, she knew exactly who he was. He had been one of the cruelest guards in Ravensbrück. And suddenly it flashed into her mind the shame of having to walk naked past him, the, the, the horror of her sister dying there. And this man kept walking towards her. And he didn't recognize her, but he came up to her and he said to her, I was a guard at Ravensbrück. I did some awful things, but I've become a Christian and I want you to forgive me. He put out his hand and as he stretched out her, his hand, at that very moment, she said her heart went cold. And this is what she says. It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion, I knew that too. Forgiveness is the act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. And I found this love to be limitless. I found this forgiveness transforms everything. It transforms our outlook, our relationships, our friendships. And personally, it's done that with my father. For God so loved the world he is so personal. God so loved you and me that he gave himself. And as we experience that love, we begin to understand that there is a relationship on offer. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life.